really great honor to having the opportunity to host this webinar session. It is a moment to extreme pleasure to welcome our today's speaker, Professor Jasjit Singh Bagla, urgent here to share his knowledge throughout his inspiring words in this talk. Professor Jasjit Singh Bagla is a professor and dean academic at Indian Institute of Science and Education Research, Mohali. He completed his MSc from Delhi University and PhD in astrophysics titled Gravitational Clustering in an Expanding Universe from Ayuka, Pune. He was a postdoctoral fellow at Institute of Astronomy, Cambridge, UK, and later on at Harvard Smithsonian Center for Astrophysics, Cambridge. He joined the Astrophysics Group at Department of Physics, Harish Chandra Research Institute in Allahabad, HRI, in November 1999, and worked as Associate Professor and Professor up to 2010. His recently renowned work on gravitational clustering, cosmological and n body simulation and dark energy. His research also includes some various aspects of cosmology and probe of the high red ship universe. Today, Professor Bagla is going to deliver a talk on gravitational lensing and James Webb Space Telescope, JWST. So, I humbly request to you all, please mute yourself during the talk for the smooth conduct of our presentation. If you have any queries, write in the chat box or ask at the end in the question answer session. So, with no further delay, let's invite Professor Bagla to deliver his lecture. Thank you so much, sir, for accepting our invitation. We are really privileged to hear from you. It's over to you, sir. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much for the kind in invitation and the introduction. I will be. Uh, I will start with the introduction to gravitational lensing. How it was. Uh, thought of historically and uh, how it has developed. The JWST part is essentially anticipating what we might see. Uh, the background image on the title slide, which you can see, is from JWST. It is one of the first deep fields which it observed. And you can see there are many distorted galaxies and arcs formed by background galaxies by the gravitational force of a cluster of galaxies which is in the foreground. So uh, I don't think I'll be showing any other, any more JWST pictures, but uh, we will talk about different aspects of lensing and uh, what some of our recent work implies for what JWST might see. So the history of gravitational lensing goes back a bit more than 200 years. Soldner calculated the deflection of light by a gravitational mass in 1801. He published it in 1804, and uh, he essentially made use of Newton's equation of motion. And uh, the fact that the mass of the particle, which is whose trajectory you are trying to calculate, uh, drops out, it cancels from both sides. So if it, it doesn't really matter whether we know uh, what is the mass of uh, photons or light particles. You can still solve the equations. And he found that uh, in case deflection is small, it can be expressed as uh, 2gm by bc square, where b is the closest approach or the impact parameter, m is the mass of the gravitating body, c is uh, speed of light, and g is uh, Newton's constant of uh, gravitation. So his, his original interest had been to see if one can observe deflection because of Earth's gravity, but uh, that turned out to be too small. And next, he calculated for uh, a ray grazing the sun, and uh, he estimated the deflection to be 0.84 arc seconds. Uh, about two centuries later, Einstein found the same number using equivalence principle. Uh, unfortunately, soon after Soldner's work, or around the same time, the Young's double slit experiment was done, and the understanding of the nature of light shifted from corpuscular uh, uh, nature, which was postulated by Newton in 17th century, to wave nature. And given that the wave nature understanding of light became dominant in the 19th century, people stopped pursuing this bending of light. Another reason, of course, was that uh, the, the deflection was too small to be measured. Einstein revisited this calculation 
in uh, 1911 using equivalence principle and he reproduced the same relationship and he started writing to astronomers and observatories asking them if this can be measured so essentially he was talking about a bending of light or starlight by about one arc second due to gravity of the sun and he thought that perhaps it can be done by looking at uh, pictures of uh, total solar eclipses he even asked astronomers if the archival pictures can be used in some way unfortunately none of those pictures were good enough to be used uh, astronomers did start thinking about uh, making this measurement but in 1912 one uh, Argentinian expedition to Brazil failed due to very poor weather. It was raining incessantly. And uh, there were a bunch of expeditions in 1914, including one by a German astronomer uh, who actually wanted to make the measurement that Einstein wanted verified. Unfortunately, by the time of the eclipse, the First World War had started and uh, all the astronomers were rounded up. Astronomers for, from Germany were treated as prisoners of war. Astronomers from uh, US, England and other uh, allied countries were uh, sent back, but their equipment was retained because space on ship was, ships was uh, precious. Uh, in a way, it was good that uh, nobody went and made a measurement between 1911 and uh, 1915 when uh, Einstein completed the general theory of relativity and uh, revisited the calculation and he realized that in general theory of relativity the answer is twice as big as the Newtonian calculation. Uh, this is done by taking the weak gravity limit of the full equation which is uh, shown over here. Uh, one, uh, we need not kind of go into that right now. But essentially if I have a point mass uh, with mass m and uh, a light ray comes within a distance of uh, b of this, then uh, there is a deflection which is 4gm by bc square and uh, this, this is the kind of deflection which may be measured. Of course, the additional factor of 2 meant that the, the uh, expected number for uh, starlight uh, gra gra grazing the sun uh, went up from just under 1 arc second to around 1.7 arc seconds. So, uh, let me actually come back to this picture a little bit later. This is, sorry, I, I seem to have missed some pictures. So, uh, the verification was finally done by uh, Dyson, Eddington and others in 1919. The Royal uh, Society and uh, Royal Astronomical Society in England, they had a joint uh, committee for uh, eclipses. And uh, Eddington had managed to get hold of uh, Einstein's papers on general relativity in 1916. And uh, he raised the point that a measurement of deflection of light will be extremely useful uh, to, to figure out which is the correct theory of gravity. He did understand that once special relativity had been formulated uh, and speed of light was the ultimate limit, Newtonian theory was on weak uh, foundational conceptual ground because it required Newtonian gravitation required action at a distance. So he felt that uh, perhaps uh, the general theory of relativity might be the correct one and he wanted to get it tested. Dyson, who was the royal astronomer at the time, uh, he said that uh, he figured out that the solar eclipse in 1919 was a very good opportunity to make this measurement for two reasons. One is that uh, the, the uh, eclipse was is, is one of the longest on record, last totality lasting about six minutes. The other being that the sun was in the constellation of Taurus, fairly close to the Hyades open cluster at the time of eclipse. And therefore, there were a large number of stars which could potentially be used for making the measurements. Now, Eddington and Dyson were uniquely placed to make such measurements because the uh, international project for uh, creating a photographic atlas of the sky, uh, I mentioned briefly in our informal discussion before the, before the talk. So in that, uh, Dyson 
had taken the lead and he had uh, developed uh, simple techniques uh, computational techniques to measure the uh, parallax towards star which essentially meant uh, required uh, them to measure separations of stars on a photographic plate and uh, eddington had made good use of it and uh, had applied that so both of them were familiar with techniques which could be used on photographic plates to measure variations of the order of one arc second so uh, they could not have been a better pair the uh, expedition preparation of the expedition was very uh, difficult because earlier the war was going on and even when the war ended it was very very difficult to get resources but they did manage to put something together and they put together two expeditions one to uh, the principe uh, in the of the west of african coast and the other to brazil uh, in in a place called sobral so there were total of three telescopes used in these two places and the original plan was that observers will stay at the same site for three months after the eclipse so that uh, they can also take a picture of the same part of the sky without sun being anywhere near however for eddington that had uh, plan had to be changed because the only shipping company which ran ships up to principe was uh, the workers in that were going to go on strike so eddington essentially packed his bags uh, and all the plates soon uh, very very soon after the eclipse the analysis was all done in uh, the sobral plates were analyzed in uh, uh, greenwich and the uh, principe uh, plates were analyzed by eddington in uh, cambridge Uh, there were two telescopes in sobral the smaller one performed well uh, much much later uh, much later being 1970s when computers became available and better analysis could be done people realized that uh, both the telescopes on sobral actually gave the correct result but initially there was some confusion between uh, stars being out of focus or there being a change of scale in the image which were critical inputs to the method which dyson and eddington used anyhow they were able to prove that uh, the best fit to observations is indeed uh, very very close to the number that einstein predicted and very very far away from the newtonian or the equivalence principle prediction this was verified a few years later uh, by american astronomers during a total solar eclipse uh, seen from australia so once that was done uh, people started wondering whether uh, uh, what one can see one can observe bending of light uh, by other concentrations of matter the first person to uh, refer to this was uh, fred zwicky who in his paper in 1935 uh, said that uh, the total mass in coma cluster of galaxies seems to be much much higher than the mass in stars in galaxies which make up the cluster so he argued that gravitational lensing could possibly be used to figure out what is the true mass along with other methods but uh, the, no observational evidence or support for uh, such lensing came by for a long time the first first ever gravitational lensing observation in terms of extra galactic lensing was uh, in 1979 after that people realized that what was required was to go down to very very uh, extremely high sensitivity in terms of flux and once you reach there you begin to see gravitational lensing so through 1980s and 1990s with the advent of uh, ccd detectors which uh, which are about a factor of 10 more efficient than uh, photographic plates uh, one one could uh, begin to discover gravitational lensing systems all over the sky so the way it operates is this we are an observer sitting on earth which is in milky way and there may be a very very distant blue galaxy which is shown on top left over here and uh, there is an intervening cluster of galaxies <coughs> which is bending light rays from the source such that we end up seeing this uh, galaxy in multiple directions in the sky so we see multiple images of the same source so this is a schematic 
and this is a description of how lensing works. The magnitude of lensing, of course, depends only on the mass uh, enclosed within the cluster and the nearest approach of, uh, of the light rays. And therefore, it becomes a probe of total mass inside uh, clusters of galaxies. So what physicists do is to make approximations. So one of the approximations which is made is the thin lens approximation, arguing that the extent of the mass distribution which is causing the light rays to bend is very, very small compared to distance from observer to the lens and from lens to the source. And therefore, we can assume the entire mass distribution to be in a thin sheet. This simplifies the problem considerably because in mathematical terms, it essentially becomes a one-step map. And arguably, it is a good approximation because the uh, diameter of clusters of galaxies is a couple of megaparsecs, whereas distances from observers to clusters and from cl clusters to distant galaxies can be hundreds to thousands of uh, megaparsecs. So essentially, the thickness of the lens is less than a percent of the relevant distances. And hence, the lensing thin lens approximation is a good one. Now, once you take make this approximation, uh, it's simple geometry to see that the angle beta, which is the angle between some reference line and the direction towards the source, if the lens had not been present, can be written as angle theta, which is where you actually see the lens, see the image, and a bending term, which includes the bending angle alpha, which we calculate, calculate using general theory of relativity in the weak gravity limit, and a ratio of distances. On the numer in the numerator, we have the distance between the deflector and the source, and in the denominator, we have the distance from the observer to the source. So this, this becomes a nice way of defining, describing gravitational lensing. Uh, so the mapping is essentially uh, inverted. We know that light rays are coming from the source to the observer. But the map is described in terms of uh, angles as seen from the perspective of the observer. So we are shooting rays backwards uh, over here. But this, this turns out to be a convenient uh, approach to the whole problem. Now it turns out that the uh, bending angle can be written in terms of uh, gradient of a potential. So it's a two-dimensional potential, and the gradient is in the plane uh, of the thin lens, which can be uh, related to the mass concentration inside this uh, the, the cluster. And uh, the mapping is then written in terms of uh, the second derivative, second partial derivatives of the potential. I don't expect you to absorb these equations over here. But note that uh, I have a second derivative of potential psi, which is written as psi ij which makes it a two by two matrix. And this two by two matrix is real and symmetric, which means it has real eigenvalues. And if I call those eigenvalues lambda one and lambda two, the only place, so lambda one and lambda two are characteristics of the uh, deflector. And uh, the only uh, redshift dependent object which appears is in the prefactor A, which is the ratio of two distances. So I'm able to describe the entire map in terms of a two-dimensional potential. Okay. So to take you a little bit further into uh, technical uh, uh, aspects of lensing, so you can see that the magnification mu, which is the last equation at the bottom, uh, so this, this magnification goes to infinity if 1 minus a lambda 1 or 1 minus a lambda 2 is 0. Okay, So this is only a formal thing because uh, this defines for us a curve in the uh, image plane. Uh, that, that is all that 
uh, this does. So these are lines of infinite magnification, but since all the sources have a finite size, the actual magnification is always finite. Uh, so we can define something called critical curves, which are contours of eigenvalues. And whenever the, the bracket 1 minus a lambda 1 or 1 minus a lambda 2 goes to 0, that is the critical curve. I'll show you examples in a short while. When we map these critical curves to the source plane, which is where the source is sitting, uh, these uh, simple contours can often take a, a very complicated uh, kind of a shape. And these are called caustics. The interesting thing is that the caustics, so let me show the next slide and then come back here. So if I take an elliptical mass, then the left panel here, shows you the critical curves, which are contours of eigenvalues. And the right-hand panel shows you the caustics, which are the each point on the critical curve mapped using the lens equation to the source plane. Now, you can see that there are places where the uh, caustic is pinched. It has a cusp. Okay, So these are special points. And these are defined in catastrophe theory, uh, which is the theory of uh, singular mappings, as uh, the place where the eigenvalue corresponding to the given eigenvector is orthogonal to the gradient of the eigenvector. You don't have to worry too much about maths uh, at, at this point. So if I can find all possible points where uh, cusps can form, then those uh, the, the, the set of those points pre, uh, gives me what are called A3 lines. And as we shall see, it is these A3 lines where all the interesting stuff happens. Now, historically, uh, astronomers have studied gravitational lensing uh, with only the critical curves and the cusps because these are stable types of image forms. But there are other types of image forms which, which give you much higher magnification, but they are rare and they are unstable. So our quest, which we started about six, seven years ago, was to try and understand uh, these rare image forms slightly better. The motivation is that in the next decade, new telescopes and new surveys are going to increase the number of known gravitational lens systems by at least a factor of 100, which means even rare types should be seen at least a few times. So that, that was the motivation. So as so this is a picture taken from uh, Narayan and Blandford, which is again for an elliptical lens. What it does is that it shows you the broad contours of critical curves and caustics as you go to higher and higher distances. So you can see that as you go to larger and larger distances, the caustics first increase in size and then decrease. And the But the cusp, the diamond-shaped cusp structure remains. There is a special thing in the middle frame over here, which has this 2U mark. This is when the cusps for the two eigenvalues, they meet up. So these are uh, degenerate points where the two eigenvalues are actually equal. And such a point is called an umbilic. Umbilic has uh, two subtypes. One is called purse, one is uh, called pyramid. So this is the purse type. So this is one of the first uh, special points which we wanted to explore. Now, gravitational lensing by nature, if you look at uh, this, this schematic, is, uh, as seen from observer's point of view, is a many-to-one map in the sense that many directions in the sky take us uh, back to the same source. So if I have a many-to-one mapping, clearly it is singular. And mappings can be singular in multiple ways. For a two-dimensional mapping, so it is a mapping from a plane to a plane, the image plane to a source plane, 
I either I can have one of these two brackets going to zero, or I can have both of these brackets going to zero. When only one bracket goes to zero, in that case, I have a singularity of a type where I am reducing the dimensionality of a area element of the image plane by one. The in the other case, I am reducing it by two. So let us see what happens in a typical gravitational lens system. So we have a source galaxy, which in a simulation we are moving behind a lens. And as it enters the caustic, I have creation of a pair of images. Uh, it, one can see that the pair of images which forms have, have opposite parity. And as the source leaves the uh, caustic, I have annihilation of two pairs of images. Let me run this again. So we go from a single image for the source to three images for the source. You can see this pair of images forming here. One more pair of images forming. So we go from one to three to five, and then back to three, and then back to one. You can see that broadly the images uh, they form some kind. They are aligned along along a circular pattern, and the radius of this circular pattern is uh, comparable to the size of the cluster. So now I will show you next as to what happens if we try to do the same thing for umbilic when I have a degenerate point. So the degenerate point is where the two cusps are meeting. You will see a sudden formation of images and they disappear. So I will run it again. Notice that when the images form, they form in some kind of a ring, except that the radius of that ring is very, very small compared to the radius of the cluster. I started looking at this particular type of uh, image formation about 20 years ago. But in 2009, uh, someone wrote a paper saying that uh, this is going to be an extremely rare image type. And we will see at most one in the entire sky. And they said, voila, we have seen one. We expected to see at most one. And that's where the story ends. So this is the image from uh, Hubble Space Telescope. So it's uh, there are many lensed images over here, but there is a tiny ring of images near the center. I will show a zoom in of that here, which is uh, which corresponds to an umbilic. So the interesting thing is that you have a ring, but the size of the ring is not related with the mass of the lensing cluster. This is a different kind of a single. There is one more type of uh, a degenerate point, which is called pyramid, where you have three cusps of each eigenvalue uh, morphing into three cusps of the other eigenvalue. So here you have seven images, and you have this crazy Y-shaped image formation. This has never been seen. Okay, such an image form has never been seen. It is extremely rare. And in our analysis, we find that this is the going to be the rarest type of an image, and it is also the most unstable. One other uh, point singularity which one sees is called, called uh, swallow tail. Uh, I will not go into the technical details here, but here you end up with an arc. Uh, of uh, images, which is very straightish. So with the umbilic, purse umbilic, we had a ring of images which was very, very small. So the radius was much smaller than the corresponding Einstein ring radius. Here we end up with a radius of curvature, which is much, much larger than the 
radius of curvature for the Einstein ring. So this has also been seen multiple times in the sky. So this is Abel 370. Again, a Hubble Space Telescope image. The curvy lines, thin lines, which you see are actually orbits of asteroids uh, because the image was collected over tens of days. And these things uh, tend to move in the sky. So to compare representations, typically, just as I showed you an earlier image from Blandford and Narayan for a simple elliptical lens, uh, astronomers, when they want to describe a lens, they draw the caustics at a whole range of distances or redshifts. And then you try to analyze what one will see, what one will not see. What we have done is to say that all of these cusps and the point singularities which we see, they all lie on the A3 lines which mark out where the cusp can ever be. So then if I draw all the A3 lines and mark the point singularities, then I have a complete map for a given uh, gravitational lens. So we are, we are proposing that this is a simpler representation. And in this representation, if we compare uh, mass maps made for a one, one of the clusters of galaxies by different groups. So mind you, these are mass maps made with different assumptions, but using the same observational constraints. We find that there are some features which are common, like this cross kind of a shape. But there are many things which are uncommon, implying that the observations that we have at present are not good enough to constrain the uh, potential or the mass model in detail. So what we did for our further analysis was to say that, look, this is one model which is giving us the smallest number of uh, exotic image types. So to be conservative, we will use this in our analysis, uh, further analysis. So what we did was uh, twofold. One was to take a model for the uh, uh, kind of uh, galaxy populations that the James Webb Telescope, Space Telescope will see. And uh, the other was to use the Hubble Space Telescope observations as, as the background. And then did an estimate of how many different image types of these exotic image types we will see. Okay, So you can see for uh, different uh, models, we get different types of numbers. The y-axis here is logarithmic, and uh, you can see that the red curves, uh, which, which correspond to one of the umbilics, is the lowest over here. Okay, So in the end, settling down with the simplest uh, and the most conservative model for gravitational lensing, uh, we find that uh, we expect to see one umbilic for roughly every five clusters of galaxies. And uh, we expect to see a similar number of swallowtail uh, kind of image formations. But we don't find too many pyramid uh, image formations. So this is the work where we did a mock observation of the Hubble Ultra Deep Field as a background with Abel 370 as the lensing cluster. Another example of the same. So what we did was we took the Hubble Ultra Deep Field and then we placed Abel 370 in front of it in slightly displaced and rotated the orientations to do some statistics. So what we find is that for Abel 370, the with Hubble Ultra Deep Field as the background, uh, the number, the probability of uh, purse or swallowtail formation is uh, fairly high. It goes up to about uh, for more than 40% for both of these uh, similarity types. And if we add up for uh, different types of different clusters where mass models are available, we get 20% uh, as the possibility of image uh, per sense volatile formation. Another interesting thing which we can do is that in gravitational lensing, as we are seeing uh, multiple images of the source, these multiple images are formed by light rays traveling along different paths. And these different paths do not have the same length, which means that if the original source is changing its brightness as a function of time, 
if there are variation in this in that case i will see changes in brightness at uh, different times in uh, different images so there will be a time delay across uh, uh, time delay across different images and this time delay can be used to estimate the scale of the universe because remember there are distances to various things involved one very interesting thing which we found was that but if we zero in on swallow tail or purse in that case the expected time delay is much shorter so this is an interesting thing which can be used uh, to to carry out of plan and carry out observations because in case of purse the longest uh, time delays we have are of the order of 1000 days whereas in swallow tail the longest time delays are of the order of a year about 300 days and this is reasonable unlike typical five image systems where the time delay can be as much as several many many years essentially so the work i described to you is based on uh, these uh, publications and this is my summary i will stop after this and uh, take questions so lensing by galaxies and clusters can be described in terms of a lens equation and characteristic image formations can be described in terms of singularities of this map uh, so all of this is uh, coming from mathematical uh, theories based on catastrophe theory to give a lens map and this gives us a map this will be useful in the coming decade as the number of lens systems is expected to increase by several orders of magnitude our analysis shows that the expected number of exotic exotic images has been underestimated by a significant amount and uncertainties in the expected number of images due to modeling do not change this conclusion and we have shown that the time delay in image formations around point cost caustics is considerably lower than in other image formations now where does jwst figure in all of this well jwst is more than 10 times sensitive as compared to the hubble space telescope and uh, while it cannot be expected to be a discovery machine in the sense that we we cannot do an our sky survey uh, using jwst so easily but what can be done is that as other instruments and surveys carry out uh, uh, their analysis and they discover gravitational lens systems jwst can be used to follow up and uh, help us refine both mass maps and also discover different types of uh, exotic image formations which may not be visible using earth based uh, observatories okay so i will stop here and uh, take questions thank you professor jasit Okay. Thank you so much, sir. Uh, there are a couple of yeah. questions. And... Okay. Yeah. So, are the questions there in chat? Yes. Yeah, so, uh, first question is from myself. Uh, what I want to ask the different uh, singularities you have talked about. You said some of them are often visible and some of them are rare, like the pyramid. one uh, what exactly determines that which right. one is going to be yeah right so there are singularities which are uh, essentially of the fold and cusp type which are uh, stable in the sense that if i take the lens and if i perturb the lens in some way by adding shear or by increasing or decreasing the mass then the fold and cusp will always be there they may shift around a little bit but they will always be there so that is why it was attractive for people to study those in great detail early on when we go to uh, caustics uh, when we go to uh, singularities where the mapping is essentially from a two dimensional area element to a point in that case all of these are unstable formally unstable in the sense that if i perturb the gravitational lens in any way 
uh, lens map in any way, then the uh, singularity may or may not be there. Okay. So what we did was to carry out an empirical analysis of uh, how much do I have to disturb or perturb the gravitational lens in order to get rid of the, these point singularities. And we found that uh, uh, the, the, umbilic, the purse umbilic is the most stable out of these three unstable ones. The swallow tail is next and pyramid umbilic is the uh, least stable make you lose it. The other thing is that the typical image formation that we associate with any given type of singularity, that typical image formation for fold and cusp is the same for source at any redshift. But the typical image formation for umbilic and swallow tail uh, takes that form only for a very narrow range in redshift. So that makes it harder because not even though you may have a source in the exactly the correct direction, but it mm. may not be at the correct redshift. And therefore, the cross oh. section turns out to be lower. Okay. okay. And uh, I, have, I have one more question. So what is the typical redshift, a uh, range of redshift that where most of the lens objects have been observed so far? Are there any preference on the distribution? Uh, yeah, so we have actually, most of the cluster lens systems are at a redshift of between 0.2 to 0.6. And uh, we have seen background sources going all the way back up to a redshift, redshift of 10 or so. Oh, wow. Okay. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Yeah. So the second question I see is by Manas Dogra. Gravitational lensing causes magnification of the images generally but the rays are traveling more due to lensing. So won't the images be fainter due to attenuation? So the magnification actually happens not because uh, uh, not because of, or attenuation does not happen, because the actual area for the given uh, object, for the images in the sky, increases because of uh, multiple images. So when we talk about magnification or amplification, it is in contrast with what we would have seen without the lens. Without the lens, we would have seen one image. With the lens, we see many, many images of the same source. And when we add up brightness of all of these multiple images, we have a magnification. I hope that answers your question, Manas. OK, next question is uh, Shubhajit Katua. What are the properties should have in a telescope using that we can detect gravitational lensing? Why is James Webb Space Telescope uh, special for that? Okay. One essentially needs to be able to detect very low surface brightness. And uh, for that, getting out of Earth's atmosphere is very important. Uh, James Webb Space Telescope is not just out of Earth's atmosphere. It is also away from the Earth-Moon system. It is on the Lagrange, L2 Lagrange point for the Earth-Sun system. And there is a sun shield, there is a shield, or rather there are five shields which block out any radiation from Earth, Moon, and Sun uh, towards the telescope. This allows, automatically allows all the detectors to cool down to a very low temperature. And it does not have to contend with any emission from the atmosphere. So all of these properties plus the fact that James Webb Space Telescope works in the infrared, uh, that allows it to be many, much more sensitive. So with gravitational lensing, we want to see sources which are very, very far away. But far away sources means that they will be light from those sources will be red shifted. And uh, as the light from these sources is red shifted, the uh, entire spectrum kind of uh, moves from uh, ultraviolet towards blue, red, and then infrared. So for very, very distant sources, if we try to observe with optical telescopes, we will actually see very little or almost nothing. James Webb Space Telescope, uh, see the optical window is going from uh, uh, 3,000 angstrom to around 7,000, 8,000 angstrom. Uh, James Webb Telescope is sensitive from 6,000 angstrom going up to uh, 25,000 
no, not 250,000 angstrom. So the source can be very, very far away. Light can be highly redshifted, but still James Webb Space Telescope will be able to observe it. The other aspect is that it has a very high resolution, which means that uh, we can make much, much better images than we can ever make from the ground. So Shubhajit, I hope this answers your question. All right. So next is from Shri Suman. If we change the angle in JWST, can we reach far back in time? I mean, is it related to wavelength? Yes, it is related to wavelength indeed. Uh, the most of the radiation from stars and galaxies is uh, between uh, ultraviolet starting at a wavelength of around 912 angstrom and uh, going up. But if I have a source which is at a redshift of 10, that 912 angstrom would have been redshifted to uh, 10,000 angstrom, which I cannot observe from the Earth. Whereas James Webb Telescope can comfortably observe that because it is able to observe uh, up to a wavelength of 250,000 angstrom. So, so Priyanshu Priti Patil has the next question. Is there any possibility of detecting gravitational waves in the space? It should be much more strong than when it reaches Earth. Always research happening in this. Okay, gravitational waves. Uh, see, any process of detection has to rely on coupling of gravitational waves with matter. And uh, the earthbound observatories that we have at present are able to detect gravitational waves in the wave frequency range of around 30 hertz going up to about 2 kilohertz. There are future upgradations of these instruments which will increase this range somewhat. There is a space-based uh, detector which is planned, LISA, which will be able to detect millihertz kind of uh, frequencies. Uh, the, there is one other experiment which is going on, which what, what it does is to observe pulsars uh, all over the sky for extended periods of time. And uh, these pulsars are uh, natural clocks. They typically emit uh, pulses of radiation separated by a very short time period, which can be anywhere between a few milliseconds going up to a few seconds. So these pulsar are, pulsars are distributed all over uh, space within our own galaxy. And if there is a very long wavelength gravitational wave uh, passing by, then that can influence the time of arrival from different pulsars. Uh, so that uh, Pulsar monitoring network has been making such observations for about a decade and they are starting to put very strong constraints on the amplitude of gravitational waves uh, at frequencies which are of the order of nanohertz. Yeah. I, I hope that answers your question, Priyanshu. <laughs> Any other questions? Uh, if anyone has any questions, you can please unmute and ask Professor Jasjit. Hello, sir. Uh, am I audible? Yes. Yes, yes Abhishek, you are audible. Yeah. Sir, so, uh, I am from uh, HSS department, like uh, yeah, ICERS also have humanities and social sciences department. So I am from liberal arts in IIT Hyderabad. So not having that much uh, knowledge of uh, what happening in paper and and what, what was the lambdas and all. So uh, my my question is about something related to social sciences and sciences because I'm working on science and technological studies, which is related to science with the with the society. Uh, and I'm very, very much keen about knowing space and what's going on about the research of space, like Hubble retired and now James Webb Space Telescope comes with the infrared and color coding, a lot of things. So, and uh, like NASA and ISRO are working a lot of, lot of in the space region. But uh, suddenly a, a guy came uh, from a Tesla a multi billionaire company and, and tweeted a photo uh, to the Twitter, which is a big sensation of, of a, just a, a picture, uh, which is which is a reflection of, of a surface of, of your floor mat. So I want to uh, I want to know about the the uh, aura of, of science, which is which is not having in society because ours are 
our uh, our heroes are not scientists our heroes are are somewhere else from our aspirations are coming from somewhere else so i want to talk about more that yeah so if you look at uh, popular media uh, then clearly anyone who studies anything is labeled as nerdy and uh, therefore that is taken off the list of aspirations and uh, i think that is basically it because uh, people want to lay emphasis on uh, having a good life without having to do much and if you want to be a scientist then uh, or a social scientist or a scholar then you have to spend a lot of time studying and thinking and uh, in 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 popular culture that is i wouldn't say looked down upon but uh, or made kind of sometimes made fun of or generally ignored as not an aspirational route yeah that 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 is my take on it i don't know whether it satisfies you or not thank you sir i have one more question yes please shri suman yeah. uh, recently in the jupiter we can see the jwst in incredibly incredible we can say see some uh, like uh, what can i say in jupiter that actually we didn't get before the jwst so say yet right. similarly if we go to the Like quasars and pulsars, like uh, the supermassive black hole, all kind of thing. If we, the JWST can work at the uh, accelerant, then can we get in the black hole accretion disk related information about that? Well, the uh, range of uh, wavelengths where JWST can observe is certainly the uh, interesting one if we want to probe uh, such regions. we need to have something which is emitting light otherwise the telescope will not be able to see it but remember that uh, the observations observational evidence in favor of a supermassive black hole at the center of our own galaxy is based on observations of stars and their orbits around the unseen black hole now jwst can potentially see those things very very clearly and uh, it may be able to see other things also but in this specific instance uh, uh it, the technology for ground based observations is also moving up the uh, vlt the the german group which uh, leads the efforts at vlt in this regard has now started doing interferometry in the k band so they use multiple telescopes uh with a wavelength of around 5 microns and they use interferometry to pinpoint locations of stars which gives them a resolution which is comparable to what uh, jw jwst has but they still need to do a lot of corrections because of adaptive optics so i'm sure that jwst will shed interesting light on many of these things ah uh, that will be great this project okay thank you Uh, Professor Jaisit, can you please briefly uh, talks about your research group and then what is your uh, the projects going on in your with the students and your group? Right. So uh, I don't have a big group. I have only have a couple of students and a postdoc. My main area of interest is in uh, issues related with cosmology. Mm -hmm. uh, last few years, I have been working actively in gravitational lensing. and at present my students are working on uh, two sets of problems one is working on uh, atomic hydrogen in uh, galaxies and how it may evolve and how we may observe it and uh, the other student is working on a problem related to formation of galaxies but at the level of uh, formation of halos so not going into directly observable properties of galaxies So it turns out that uh, over the last uh, almost 50 years there has been an effort to understand the mass spectrum of collapsed halos uh, 
uh, which are expected to form. And the entire theory has been developed in terms of variables which are independent of the cosmological model and also independent of the initial spectrum of fluctuations. So what we have been able to demonstrate quite conclusively, and this is some work which we'll be submitting to a journal in a week or so, is uh, that this universal approach is not correct and there are modifications around it which need to be taken into account. Mm -hmm. uh, I do have a few other problems with, that I'm looking at so with one of my postdocs. Uh, we are looking at uh, what happens to uh, the merge, merged black holes. So we, we detect mergers of black holes in uh, gravitational waves using LIGO. But what happens when they merge? Because one of the conjectures is that many of these mergers are happening in globular clusters. And when gravitational waves are emitted in the merger process, that emission may, may not be isotropic. That may be asymmetric. And uh, this may give a kick to the resulting black hole. So globular clusters are massive and compact. But still, they may not be able to hold the black hole, the resulting black hole. So we are looking, exploring possibilities of where such black holes may end up and in, in terms of uh, making predictions for observations. These are some of the things which I'm working on at present. Okay, thank you. Uh, anyone else have any questions for Professor Jansi? Uh, if not, so, so let's thanks Professor Jansi for such a nice talk on gravitational wave, I guess uh, many of them, particularly the MSc students, they were actually looking for this talk and hopefully they will be benefited and they will know at least a few things about the gravitational waves. Uh, and over to you, Sri, to conclude the session. Thank you so much, sir. And thanks to all for joining. It's particularly interesting for me, at least, so I can see hear from sir. Next time surely we will hear again too sir. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Goodbye sir.